Welcome to the UC Santa Barbara School Psychology Information Webinar. My name's Shane Jimerson. I have the good fortune to be here today with Dr. Thompson, Dr. Goodwin, and Dr. Ortiz. We'll be presenting on behalf of the UCSB School Psych faculty, which also includes Dr. Dowdy, Dr. Sharkey, and Dr. Quirk. You can see the photos here in the introductory slide. And uh, for those that are active on social media, feel free to uh, take screenshots, post information during the presentation, and also our Twitter handles are included down at the bottom of this first slide and again at the, the end slide. Now, uh, for today, we have prepared some fabulous information to share with you, and each of us will uh, provide some information as well as uh, some comments and reflections and allow time for question and answers as well. But to begin with, we did a poll before we launched our session, and the results indicate that there's 34% of our current participants who are interested in the master's degree program. There are 45% who reported that they are interested in the doctoral PhD program, and there are 21% who have indicated an interest in both, so still considering uh, all the options, which is fantastic. In terms of the current positions of individuals who are with us today, there are about 60% indicating that they are presently undergraduate students, and so they might, that could be any given year, junior, senior, or, or, or beyond, but undergraduate students, about 60%, about 25% who are graduate students. Great to have you with us as well, especially those who are in master's programs or other degree programs that might have an interest in uh, applying to the school site master's and or doctoral programs here at UCSB. Uh, there's also about 10% who are working full-time as research assistants, about 15% uh, who are working full-time in the schools, and about 7% that are working full-time out of the schools and about 7% other. Now, in terms of uh, what, what uh, the participants are indicating that they're most uh, interested in or thinking about attending graduate school, the most important considerations that they've reported are 100% the quality of the program. So we're hoping to share that type of information with you today in this info information webinar, and also uh, providing links to information that's online. Also the quality of the faculty, you'll start to get a sense of that, but you'll also learn about how to easily access our bios and additional information, as well as our email addresses. 38% um, said the geographic location of the program. 83% said the financial cost of the program. So good that we included a slide on that topic. Uh, clearly that's an important consideration as well. And then 7% uh, indicate other considerations. And we hope that you'll put those into the question and answers or chat to uh, ask us about during the session today. So with that, this has probably given uh, the others enough time to join in and be with us today. So we'll go ahead and uh, march forward and uh, I'll share briefly what the agenda is and then we'll rotate around in terms of the presenters. And so, Shane, did we yeah. hit record? Oh, I totally, yes, I did. Thank you. you. Did. Okay, excellent. Hopefully that's showing up on your screens, um, but fortunately it says that it's blinking. Yes, okay, great. Thank you. In terms of the agenda, we're going to briefly share information. Uh, what is school psychology for those who are still sort of exploring? What degree programs do we offer at UCSB? What do the programs include? as well as a strong emphasis in this informational session on what makes our programs unique. And then as we indicated, there will be time for questions which you're welcome to provide in the chat or the question and answers function throughout the presentation, but there should be time at the end to be certain that we're able to address each of those. Okay, so with that, uh, we'll go to the next one and I'll turn it over to Dr. Thompson to start us off. All right, thank you, Dr. Jimerson. So when you think about you know, school psychology, think of it as a career in which you, as a student, as a burgeoning school psychologist, can make a meaningful impact in the lives of the students whom you'll be serving. Um, you'll really be working towards helping to unlock each child's potential for success. And we really cover a broad range of expertise. It's not just limited to um, assessment. 
we really work on, we have expertise in mental health, learning, behavioral assessments, implementing interventions that look at, you know, behavior, social, emotional support, academic interventions. And our goal is really to support the mental health needs of students and as well, and that also includes their developmental needs. And we also endeavor to help them to, you know, grow and succeed academically, socially, behaviorally, and emotionally. Excellent. Yes. Okay. So what is school psychology? So yes, it's a career that can make a difference. And we really focus on assessment, as I stated earlier, but it's not just constrained to assessment, but intervention, you know, working with families, consultation, community networking, collaborating with other professionals, um, training, working with interns. We really endeavor to create learning environments that are supportive for everyone, not just for students, but for teachers and other ed education professionals. Our goal is to really improve school-wide policies and collaborate with community providers. Here at UCSB, we engage in a lot of you know, community collaboration with schools and other community providers um, who really work with you know, school-age um, students. Excellent. We'll turn it over to Dr. Goodwin. All right. Thank you, Dr. Jimerson and Dr. Thompson. Um, and Dr. Thompson just described what a wonderful field school psychology is. And school psychology is really thriving here at UCSB. We have two programs. Uh, we have our master's program, our MED program. This is a program that's designed to prepare practitioners who are ready to go into the schools. It's a three-year full-time program. Uh, and that consists of two years at UCSB and a third year internship. And graduates of this uh, MED program will be eligible for the school psychology credential through, uh, uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about this later, the pupil personnel services credential, as well as the NCSB. Uh, they're eligible to be a nationally certified school psychologist and also eligible to be licensed as a licensed educational psychologist. For our master's program, we anticipate cohorts of about 10 students. We also have our doctoral program, and this is really designed for future scholars, designed to prepare professors. Um, it's about a five-year program, it's full-time, it might be uh, shorter for those who come into the doctoral program with the master's degree. Uh, three to four years are spent at US, uh, UCSB. And then depending on whether you come in with the master's or not, your fourth or fifth year is an internship. Just like with the MED program, graduates are eligible for the pupil personnel services to practice in the schools here in California, as well as the NCSP nationally certified school psychologist credential. Graduates of the doctoral program are also eligible for licensure as health service psychologists. Um, and we anticipate cohorts of about four students. And so for just to provide a little more information, both of these programs meet state and national credentialing standards. So in our three-year MED program, all students proceed through the same sequential cohort model program to fulfill all necessary requirements. This includes 60 units for the MED, um, plus 24 additional units for the pupil personnel uh, services credential. Um, students in our doctoral program complete the five-year program, and the final year for both of the programs is a full-time internship. And this can be completed in-state or across the country. Completion of coursework fulfills the accreditation requirements that are consistent with NASP and uh, the National Association of School Psychologists and the California Department of Education to be credentialed as school psychologists going out into the schools. And as I mentioned earlier, our MED program is really designed to develop practitioners. Um, 
So for instance, the NAS practice model has two major parts, professional practices and organizational principles. Um, the professional practices include the 10 domains of school psychology practice that are organized into three areas, foundations of school psychological service delivery, practices that permeate all aspects of service delivery and direct and indirect services to children, families, and schools. Graduates of both programs will be credentialed to practice um, school psychology in the schools. Importantly, at the doctoral level, graduates will be eligible to be licensed to practice um, as psychologists in multiple settings. Thank you, Dr. Goodwin. And if I can get my cursor over in the right place, uh, we'll go ahead and forward it to Dr. Ortiz. Great. <clears throat> so I think uh, Dr. Goodwin was mentioning a little bit about the NAS practice model and all the domains of practice. And here on this slide, we uh, have a, a graphic for you of the NAS practice model. And once again, that's the National Organization for School Psychologists. So it's our kind of national organization for our field that really delineates the competencies that a school psychologist should have as they enter the profession. And so as you can see here, there is 10 domains of practice that vary from database decision making, assessment, intervention, collaboration with communities, um, legal and ethical practices. So there is a, a breadth, a wide breadth, really, of um, of strategies, techniques that we utilize as school psychologists in our day-to-day -day practice. So this slide really highlights that for you. And for the students coming into the program here at UCSB, you know, you can rest assured that you're going to be receiving training to be able to feel confident in your role as school psych to fulfill these kind of roles and responsibilities for both the master students and the doctoral level students. Excellent. Next. <laughs> Great. And so <clears throat> what really makes UCSB uh, unique, right? So there are many school psychology programs in the nation in California. Uh, why? Why should you think about coming here at UCSB? So, so one thing that makes us unique or stand out is really our commitment to advancing equity. Um, we really want to prepare school psychologists, uh, the, our trainees coming into our program to be really cult culturally responsive, to be able to work with all students, right? Students with disabilities, students who are culturally and linguistically diverse. Um, and there is, you know, a current really strong push for that. Resources are being allocated. You know, <clears throat> they hired me recently <laughs> um, and I do a lot of work with bilingual school psychologists and I know other faculty here are really committed to that either through their research or through their clinical practice. So, um, and I know we're also engaging in efforts to really try to build a program that supports um, and is committed to training bilingual school psychologists in particular. So next. Excellent. And then can we go to the next slide, Shane? Oh. There yeah. we go. Okay, great. And so what else makes this unique is this integration of the theory that you're reading in the books um, and applying that to not only your scholarship, all students, master's level and doctoral level students have the opportunity to engage in research and also field work. So we're really integrating and making um, what you're reading in your textbooks uh, and applying that into your day-to-day -day work. So we really try to emphasize that integration. So, yeah. Okay, and that's my opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Ortiz. And uh, back to me in terms of another feature that makes our program unique is our emphasis on bringing science to practice. And in many ways, I would suggest this may be the hallmark of our program and our commitment, given that we're at a research intensive university setting and we are each actively engaged as scholars in conducting research and writing and reflecting that uh, importantly, 
we emphasize the value and importance of using these research findings in psychology as well as education in our efforts to provide psychological services in the schools. And in turn, we emphasize the analysis of problems that are encountered in the school settings from a scientific and evaluative research point of view. So each of you had noted in the training standards, the profession training standards outlined by the National Association of School Psychologists, that there's an emphasis for master's and doctoral students to have preparation that cuts across research, evaluation, database decision ma making, et cetera. But also the science to practice permeates all of the various domains because looking for what are those evidence-based interventions that have been demonstrated to be effective with particular populations of children and families and uh, having that foundational knowledge that will help us as professionals to engage in providing uh, the optimal support services. In addition, uh, for the doctoral students, they're going to be immersed in even more extensive research and scholarship but ultimately, school psychology is an applied science. And so fundamentally, through the, through the experience here at UCSB, uh, for the master's students as well as the doctoral students, they're establishing foundational knowledge. Uh, some of the differences might be that the doctoral students are expected to take more additional courses that relate to the methodology and statistics and both qualitative as well as quantitative uh, analytical strategies. So the doctoral students would uh, be required to take more of those relative to the master's students, but there's a foundation and an emphasis on bringing the science to practice across the board. And importantly for the doctoral students, this emphasis that we have is also preparing them to do future scholarship in their role as faculty members and in preparing the next generation of school psychologists. So this emphasis on bringing science to practice, I believe is really a hallmark of our program as our faculty have had these discussions uh, over the years. The next uh, point that I wanna make is similar to what Dr. Ortiz was sharing earlier, but I wanna add another dimension to it. The, the program's unique in the sense that we have integrated coursework, field work, and research experiences such that what you experience in the classroom setting here at UCSB is quickly transferred to the fieldwork experiences that are also required. So for master's students, that would begin uh, as of the first year. For the doctoral students, they would have some assignments that would be included uh, for the first year, but they would not have as intensive immersion in the actual uh, fieldwork on a, on a weekly basis. Whereas the master's students, because they're only here, as Dr. Goodwin mentioned, for a couple of years before going off on internship, they hit the ground running during that first year. And in each of these instances, the doctoral students are actively engaged, for instance, from the, from the first year in research activities, working with research teams. And some of the incoming graduate students bring tremendous background and experiences with research, but for some others, they're building those foundational skills. So whatever level they come in at, they're able to engage and be a part of our ongoing active research teams, as well as the master's students. The master's students don't have the same level of requirements in terms of, uh, for instance, a second year research project, which is required of the doctoral students, but there is an expectation that the master students through their coursework and through the knowledge they're obtaining as related to methods and evaluation, they will be utilizing those skills and knowledge in the uh, experiences that they're having out in their field work as well. So this integration of coursework, field work, and research is something that is a strong emphasis here at UCSB. Again, it makes sense. We're within a research intensive setting within the University of California, but we're also fully committed to preparing professionals to provide services uh, to children and families. Okay, so with that, we'll go ahead and turn it over to uh, back to Dr. Thompson, yeah? All right, thank you, Dr. Jemerson. So what makes our programs unique? So we really do emphasize, not only do we emphasize scholastic excellence, research, but we really think it's important. We believe, we strongly believe it's important that you all develop personal connections and collaborate closely with one another, not just with one another in terms of your peers, but with us as, as well, because we have a deep-seated investment 
in your personal success and your professional success. So that what that means is that we have small class sizes. That way we can really understand what's going on in your, your academic life and really play get a hands-on role in some of those founda foundational level skills that you'll be developing. You'll stay with your own cohort as you progress through the sequence, um, which means that you'll really get to know each other and you'll know and be known by all of your instructors, which would be us. Excellent. And as we transition, I know folks are putting some questions in there and we will definitely answer each of those. So uh, keep them coming. Yes. Yeah, so in line with the unique aspects of our program, our program follows a developmental course sequence, which is designed to provide you potential students the opportunity to develop and strengthen foundational level skills, be it, you know, assessment administration, statistical knowledge, intervention. And we really do continuously strive to narrow opportunity gaps by focusing on populations that have been historically excluded from quality education and school ba school based mental health. And again, like I said earlier, you know, we really do emphasize close collaborations with your cohort. Um, and we really do, you know, emphasize and promote full immersion and field work. We, our second year students are, you know, hit the ground running by completing field work projects, by strengthening their practice and practice. Um, in addition, close mentoring and supervision. These are things that really make us a strong and excellent program. Thank you, Dr. Goodwin or Dr. Thompson, and I think we're turning it over next to Dr. Goodwin. Sorry, there you go. Yes. Um, what also makes our programs unique and strong is we have superb, talented students. Um, we're a program that really values and embraces diversity. I think that's reflected not only amongst our students, but our faculty. Um, and uh, we encourage uh, committed, able, talented students to apply. Um, we have students who practice curiosity and lifelong learning, right? Uh, uh, Dr. Thompson and Dr. Jenderson had mentioned before the spirit of collaboration, right? And that's not just between students, but it's also among and between faculty as well. Uh, as Dr. Thompson had said, you get to work very closely with your instructors. Um, uh, we have students who are advocates for children and particularly for underserved students. As mentioned before, we really place a premium on advancing equity to our students. And we have students who become leaders who really want to improve the educational system and the field of school psychology. And uh, I'm quite proud of our students uh, and our faculty and um, I think this is a great place to, to learn. Next slide. Um, so, you know, it's an uh, outstanding academic community and a great cl climate. And one of the things that um, we do that I think is pretty unique is that we do progress monitor fun, right? We're here in beautiful uh, Santa Barbara, California, uh, and there are a lot of opportunities to have fun. Uh, we also want to build community. We want to um, provide opportunities for um, healthy activities, for self-care, because really those are the skills that you have to practice once you're in the field as a, a school psychologist. It's a rewarding field, um, but it's also one where it's important for you as those leaders uh, and advocates for children to also prioritize taking care of yourself. And our program is committed to supporting students in doing that. Excellent, thank you, Dr. Goodwin. And bounces back to me for a couple of slides. As uh, Dr. Goodwin was uh, sharing that uh, UC Santa Barbara School Psych Program has an established tradition of excellence. And he has he emphasized preparing future leaders, preparing leaders whether it's at the master's uh, degree level or the doctoral level, uh, our graduates go out and serve their communities. They, they're leaders in their schools, they're leaders in their districts, they're leaders in the state of California with the California Association of School Psychologists, 
as well as leaders nationally with the National Association of School Psychologists, as well as Division 16, which is the school psychology division of the American Psychological Association. And so our students across all levels are prepared to be leaders. We actively engage our students while they're here with us on campus to pursue opportunities, to develop their leadership skills, and, and then continue to communicate and reach out to them throughout their careers uh, to help encourage and facilitate their ongoing leadership contributions. And uh, you'll see in these next couple slides a couple of uh, examples of this in terms of uh, some of our recent graduates. And as Dr. Goodwin said, we're tremendously proud of our graduates and they are just an exceptionally talented group of individuals that come to us and we have the good fortune of working alongside them collaboratively through their graduate preparation and then watching them flourish and, and really be the change throughout their uh, careers. So this is just an example of uh, UCSB uh, faculty alumni. So these are graduates, uh, of, of just a few of our recent graduates who are doctoral uh, PhD level school psych uh, scholars, graduates who have embraced the opportunity to take on faculty positions uh, throughout California, throughout the country. And in fact, if you look at Dr. Chen most recently at the Chinese University of Hong Kong, we do have a strong international presence among our students uh, who are here with us. But some of our international students end up uh, taking faculty positions in the United States, but we're also certainly supportive and encouraging uh, the students who would like to go to another country and serve as faculty um, in those countries and those regions. As you look across the different uh, individuals that are listed here, we hope that uh, you'll notice a couple of things. One would be the diversity in terms of their, the various names that these individuals uh, come to us with and, and represent. There's tremendous diversity in their backgrounds and their experiences, culturally, racially, as well as linguistically. That's one piece to note amidst this group. And you know you can't see everything in a name clearly, but also you can see the variety of uh, faculty positions that they've pursued. And this would get busy if we listed every single instance of uh, some of the individuals who have perhaps transitioned from one university to another university. Some of them are teaching at multiple universities. But the important point here is to recognize we have graduates in the Cal State University system, in the University of California system, and basically in the, the many of the major programs throughout the country. And in some instances, they have two or three of our faculty who are serving as, uh, well, two or three of our graduates, I should say, who are serving as faculty at those institutions. Just for a couple of examples, the University of California at Riverside has three of our graduates who serve as faculty. Chapman University in Orange County has three of our graduates who serve as faculty. Uh, Cal State University uh, in Los Angeles has two of our graduates who serve as faculty. There, there's numerous, I, I won't go through the whole list here. You can see they're spread throughout the country and throughout the state uh, and around the world. But just wanted to give you a glimpse of some of our uh, graduates uh, during the past, uh, say, couple of decades who have taken on uh, faculty positions, which, as was noted by Dr. Goodwin, is the strong emphasis of our doctoral program here at UCSB, strong commitment to preparing future faculty. And I, maybe I should say something about that, because in fact, in preparing the next generation of culturally and linguistically diverse faculty, those faculty will then prepare the next generation of culturally and linguistically diverse professionals throughout the various training programs. They'll also be engaged in the research that's gonna advance the science and the knowledge in the field. And so this is critically important at the doctoral level that we have this particular commitment to preparing future faculty, okay? Now, in addition, some of you might be very interested to see a little bit about our excellence in preparing leaders in practitioners, professionals who have obtained the master's degree and have gone on to serve 
those children within our schools and those families and the staff and the administrators and work collaboratively alongside them. Again, within this uh, listing of graduates, and this is not everyone, but uh, this is just a sampling over a couple of decades of, of featuring that we have individuals from diverse backgrounds uh, with diverse cultural, racial, linguistic uh, skills, experiences, and abilities. We have individuals who have taken, of course, many positions throughout the state of California. They sometimes will relocate because they want to live in a different city, a different area. They are always at the top of the list in terms of competition with getting those positions uh, relative to um, you know, other students and other programs, our students generally end up with precisely the position that they are most interested in. So a lot of times folks will ask us, well, where do they, where do they get jobs? And the simple answer is where they want to get jobs is where they get jobs because they're, they're really well prepared. And uh, you can see, especially a lot like to be within California, but as was mentioned earlier, um, with the internship that could be in the state of California or it could be in another location. And some individuals would like to work in another uh, location outside of uh, California. And so we're, you're well prepared to do so. Okay, so that's just a little bit about uh, some of our graduates over the past uh, few years. Oh, the only other point I was gonna mention about this is that historically the UCSB master's program only admitted about three or four master's students per year. And at that point in time, uh, we were admitting you know, larger cohorts of doctoral students, but we uh, took a pause to redesign and redevelop our doctoral program. So we did not admit master's students during the most recent couple of years, last few years, but specifically as we come back in, the program is still integrated across the doctoral and the master's, but it's a much clearer lanes for both. So many of the courses that you would uh, take in, in the UCSB school psych program would include both the doctoral and the master's students in the same courses. But some of the courses that would be particular for master's students that the doctoral students wouldn't take. And then likewise, because the doctoral students are here with us for about four years in general, unless uh, they have a master's degree coming in, which as Dr. Goodwin mentioned would be less, that um, they take some additional courses clearly to fulfill those requirements of uh, APA and uh, the research and the full preparation to become future faculty. So I just wanted to mention that because some of you may be aware that uh, we had historically been admitting a small number of master's students here at UC Santa Barbara in school psychology, we had not been admitting the past few years, but good news for all of you, right now we're accepting applications to admit incoming cohort as of the fall uh, 2022. So those who apply in this upcoming cycle can join us at the master's or the uh, doctoral level. So I, I won't steal all the thunder because I know we have a few more slides on this. So, okay, we'll go ahead and turn it over to, uh, back to Dr. Thompson, yes? Yes, thank you, Dr. Jamerson. I know we have some questions waiting, so I'll get through this quickly. So the School Psychology Student Handbook will be your guide. I can tell you that when I was in graduate school, my student handbook was helpful. And actually, I still have it. For whatever reason, I just can't get rid of it. So I still have it. It's on my bookshelf, you know. I may need to refer to it. Um, but anyway, so it provides details about coursework, program sequence, requirements, and you can access it right now following the link um, in front of you that's listed on the slide. And you'll also learn about our mission, our goals, our vision for um, the program for the department. So, so definitely follow it, our program history as well. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And to apply. So here are next steps. Step one is to apply online using the graduate division e-application. I'm going to put that in the chat right now. Um, um, so, um, so you'll apply online um, using the graduate division e-application. Step two, so Zoom interviews will be conducted um, in December for both the PhD and the Master's of Education program. And then finalists will be invited on campus in January, um, February, and March for in-person interviews. And note the application deadline in red, which is the same for both um, doctoral and master's applicants. Thank you. Thank you. All right, and I think we turn it over to uh, Dr. Ortiz, yes? Yes. 
did it advance to your slide? No, on your... it did not. <laughs> Okay, I think it's working on it. There we go. Okay, okay so um, now, um, you know, some of you might be wondering, well, what um, are the faculty looking for as we're reviewing applications? What, um, and the big thing we're really looking for is goodness of fit, right? Um, it, are your goals consistent with the mission of the program? the goals of the program, right? Um, so what does that take for you to really be aware of the field of school psychology, know what it is, make sure that this is a field you want to enter. Again, if you're interested in academia and scholarship uh, research, then the PhD route is going to be a good fit for you, right? And if your goals are different, you want to be a practitioner, you want to work directly with individuals and do interventions and assessments and be in the schools, then the master's is going to be a good fit for you, right? So we're really looking for that in the application process. Um, we're going to be looking for, for that goodness of fit essentially through your application materials, which includes your personal statement. Can you speak to that? Um, we're also looking at your previous experience. To what extent can you um, align your experiences that you've had either with children or other individuals in schools or other clinical community agencies um, to the work that you would be doing as a school psychologist, either researcher or practitioner. Um, we're also looking at your prior coursework. And again, if you are applying to the PhD program, we might be more interested in research type courses, statistic type courses that you've had in the past um, or research-based experiences. <clears throat> Whereas if you're applying to the master's program, we might be looking for other areas such as, you know, um, psychology or human child development, things of that nature, right? Um, and then I, I kind of spoke to this already, that career aspirations, that link, make sure that you, you really are considering what is your goal, your, your perfect, or what are your professional goals and what's your end goal so that you're selecting the appropriate program um, in the end the application that you'll be completing. And then um, finally, as we've mentioned multiple times throughout this presentation, is that we're really committed to advancing equity. And we wanna make sure that the students we bring into our program also have that same mission, right? So we, we really are hoping to uh, attract and bring in students who are going to be committed to that agenda, who want to work with culturally and linguistically diverse students and um, make waves in, in that area. Thank you. Excellent, let's see. Okay, now it's my fun slide, uh, one that was mentioned at the uh, beginning that many folks were interested in. So we do have a way for you to simply calculate the UCSB co cost calculator is available uh, online. I went ahead and plugged in some numbers into this website for California resident. Uh, and it, it has a lot of nice options where you can toggle. So I indicated that it would be graduate enrollment, which is the same for masters or doctoral, same cost in terms of the annual um, costs associated. The campus housing with which both masters and doctoral can qualify for. You could have also chosen the other toggle, which would be community based housing. Then there's also uh, health care costs associated with uh, going to graduate school, personal expenses, as well as uh, campus fees. And then last but not least is the tuition, of course. So this uh, US, UCSB financial aid cost calculator. Uh, has all of these elements. And when you plugged in, when I plugged in and chose all of these components, uh, basically the sum total of that was $40,000 for California resident, okay? Now for a non-resident, for those of you that are tuning in who are not California residents, it's important for you to consider that for the first year, the fee of tuition is basically doubled. So instead of the roughly 15,000, it ends up being about 30,000 for the tuition and fees. These are just rough, broad numbers. Uh, but 
after the first year in either the master's or the doctoral program, you can qualify for California state residency. The good news is then those tuition and fees drop uh, to that 15,000 level for uh, the tuition uh, as a California resident. So on the first year for a master's student, for instance, the, the cost is a bit higher at 55,000. But again, this is to be considered all inclusive as the tuition and fees are only about 15,000. So the rest of that has to do with housing and personal expenses and everything. But you can, uh, you can make adjustments using this uh, cost calculator to explore it further. Now, importantly, the, each of the doctoral students that we admit receive full tuition coverage during their first year. And throughout the period of their engagement uh, doctoral studies, they receive various assistant positions. So this is important. Uh, there's also a small stipend. Uh, doctoral students, because of the duration of their commitment to the graduate uh, program, and then uh, subsequent to that, uh, typically going into academia, there's a much larger uh, amount of resources that are allocated in terms of, um, well, that's the next one, fellowships and such. But let me stick with this one, that because we're able to cover the first year of tuition and fees for all the doctoral students coming in, that means that regardless of whether it's the 15,000 or the 30,000 California resident or not, that we're able to cover those tuition and fees plus provide a small stipend. And typically uh, most of the school psych students obtain additional assistant uh, positions. Some of those are graduate student research assistant. Some of those are graduate student assistant. Some of those are teaching assistant, although teaching assistant is typically more of a second, third, fourth year type of experience. And there are a few instances where someone comes in with a master's degrees, uh, with a master's degree, completes the pedagogy in the fall, and then becomes a teaching assistant uh, as soon as the winter or spring, but that's relatively rare. Typically, you would look for those types of teaching assistant experiences. And every year you have an opportunity to, to apply for them, to be selected for them. Uh, clearly, we're attempting to provide all of the doctoral students with those types of uh, teaching assistant experiences. But also some of the doctoral students go on to after they, they go on to become the instructor of record. So they're actually uh, at the level of teaching associate. After you've been a teaching assistant for three quarters, if there are courses that are available to teach, then you, can, you might be employed as a teaching associate, for instance, and then you are the instructor of record and you do receive mentoring from a faculty member, sometimes multiple faculty member. Uh, within the program. So again, generally, because the master's students are really focused on preparing in the two years they're here for going out and providing the direct services and working with the children in the schools, generally speaking, there are not, there are not many or few, many fewer opportunities to be in student assistant positions. Uh, some students will be, but, but, uh, also the course load and just the field work is much more um, intensive for those two years that you're here with us because of that short duration and us covering the breadth of uh, preparation that was noted. Now, also just wanted to point out for those of you considering the doctoral program that many students who apply are then nominated and receive fellowships that cover all or most of tuition and fees for each of the years, or sometimes it's for three of the five years or three of the four years that they might be here. Uh, in other instances, the, that it covers tuition and fees plus a stipend. So depending upon your particular strengths and your background and experiences and anticipated contributions at UCSB, when you apply, the faculty are also considering uh, which potential fellowships we would be able to nominate you for at the department level to central campus. And we nominate, they decide, but uh, at, the, at the department level, uh, we identify those that appear to be the most competitive for these central campus uh, fellowships. Some of those have to do with extensive research experience, for example, um, presentations, publications, projects that they've worked on. Uh, clearly, there's a commitment to advancing diversity and equity and inclusion. So depending upon your personal, cultural, 
uh, and linguistic background and abilities. Uh, that's something else that we can factor into these uh, fellowship nominations. And so there's a variety of those types of supports. Generally speaking, those are primarily available for the doctoral students and not the master's students. There are some external um, funds available for master's students, and we're continuing to work hard within our graduate school of education to uh, identify and seek additional sources of support to help offset the costs uh, for the master students. But uh, as I mentioned, there's a larger um, financial investment available for the doctoral students. I also mentioned the graduate resident directors because uh, the UC Santa Barbara has fabulous graduate housing. It's been built in the last decade. It's very contemporary, very, very nicely constructed. A lot of the designs are such that there's a few shared rooms uh, or a, fair, a few individual rooms of which they share like a common uh, family space or a, uh, a kitchen, for instance. And it turns out that many of our students are well prepared to be graduate resident uh, directors. And it's not quite the same thing as being like an undergraduate resident hall RA, uh, but with that position, which you know you interview for, and many of our students have been successful in obtaining these uh, positions, they actually receive free campus housing. So that's going to decrease any of those numbers above by you know roughly uh, fifteen thousand a year because they cover the housing and they also provide a, a small stipend in addition to the um, waiving the uh, costs. Okay, so I think it turns back over to uh, uh, Dr. Ortiz before we field a bunch of the questions that we're seeing pop up. Right. Okay. So this is you know slide just to uh, again. Uh, bring your attention to the link where you can get some more information about each of the faculty. Um, the link will provide you with brief bios, some of the publications and presentations that the faculty have done. Again, especially if you are uh, interested in the doctoral program, this is a really good place for you to get to know the faculty, the line of work, because again, when we talk about goodness of fit for the application, you're going to want to make sure that you know that you are aware of the research that's currently being done at UCSB to see if it, it aligns with your interests as well. Excellent. So folks can check that out at their leisure. And that goodness of fit for the doctoral students is really important uh, with the alignment of the, the scholarship. For the master students, we collectively advise and mentor the master students. There will be a individual advisor identified upon uh, admittance, but we also work collaboratively and collectively. It's true that we do that with doctoral students, but also there we're looking for a closer match with the research and the scholarship. So as Dr. Ortiz mentioned, it'd be uh, wise to take a look at that information. Okay, so in terms of questions, I, I can see that we have about 10 questions in there. That's exciting, right? And uh, let's see, do we want to just start at the top unless somebody has a better idea? Do some school site graduates tend to become practitioners uh, as well, some school site PhD graduates? And that's one of the questions. And the short answer is yes. Clearly our program has a very strong emphasis on preparing future faculty. So in terms of coming into our program, there are many great programs that are doctoral level school site programs that are focused on preparing you specifically to be a practitioner and a professional working in the field. That's not our primary emphasis. Certainly our graduates are well prepared to do so. And some of them do uh, work in um, applied settings, but our our primary emphasis is really focused on the uh, preparation of future faculty. Yeah. In terms of does a PhD allow for more career pathways than an MED to be available upon graduation? What's our what's our faculty committee say here? I would say it depends, right? So with a PhD, one thing that pops up is that you can become a licensed psychologist, um, which you cannot do with the master's. However, that doesn't um, deter you from engaging in private practice um, because you can get, I think it was mentioned earlier, your licensed educational psychologist kind of license to practice that that will allow you to practice independently and um, in California. So there's different opportunities. 
Um, so yes and no. <laughs> Excellent. Anything else you want to add to that? Anyone else? I agree with both Dr. Jemerson and Dr. Ortiz. The, you know, the PhD is a versatile uh, degree and it does allow for a variety of additional things that you can do. But I really want to underscore that, yes, you can uh, graduate from our program and become a licensed psychologist, be a, a, a credentialed school psychologist, a nationally certified school psychologist. Many of us hold all of those credentials, but we really do prioritize a good fit because we really want to support graduates of the doctoral program and pursuing academic careers as professors. And some uh, may also practice um, in addition to their academic career. So that's also an option that is available. Excellent. Now, the next question that's on there says, uh, can you speak more on how bilingual school psychologists will be supported? And I'll just point out that both Dr. Thompson and Dr. Ortiz have the gift of uh, bilingual skills that each of us uh, treasure and have great value. And we are all sharing the commitment to the preparation of individuals. But yet, I think Dr. Ortiz or Dr. Thompson would probably be best situated to uh, respond to this. And I can share that Dr. Ortiz and I had just recently spent about an hour together today. We've spent tens or maybe hundreds of hours over the past uh, six to eight months really focused on this specific topic. So I'll turn it over to either Dr. Ortiz or Dr. Thompson to share uh, whatever they would like about uh, this preparation of how bilingual school psychologists will be supported. I guess I can start and then Miriam, if you wanna tag along just um, since Shane mentioned our work. So, um, you know, I think we're committed definitely to um, understanding the training needs of the bilingual school psychologists. I myself am a bilingual school psychologist, so I, I really have, you know, a strong understanding of what the roles and responsibilities are in the field. Um, and I collaborate with bilingual school psychs on a regular basis in a consultation group. So we're really working to uh, develop the, the program so that you're provided with strong theoretical understanding on the different issues unique to culturally and linguistically diverse students, you know, such as uh, second language acquisition development, cultural identity development, all these uh, issues that are unique to this population, but also um, allowing you to have opportunities to practice when you're in the field to giving you access to bilingual uh, supervisors, right? And then also mentorship. Like I said, um, we're all committed to um, <clears throat> training bilingual school sites that we have um, myself and Dr. Thompson, Thompson, who particularly speaks Spanish and would be more than happy, I think, to provide you with mentorship in Spanish. I know uh, it's my understanding that there is a group that meets on a regular basis to engage in consultation in Spanish. So there's opportunities to kind of develop your academic language skills in Spanish as well. Um, so those are just some of, of of the experiences that are currently happening. Dr. Thompson, do you have more to add? Yeah, so I just am including a link to the recently launched Mind and Behavior Assessment Clinic. And at our clinic, we have a number of bilingual um, graduate student clinicians. And we're working on building our bilingual assessment library. Um, although at the moment, what we can provide are um, clinical interviews in Spanish to Spanish speaking parents whose children um, will be um, completing um, an assessment. Although at the moment, we're only able to provide assessments in English because that's because we're still building our assessment library. Um, and that'll come along with um, Spanish language um, supervision. Um, so I know there's more questions, so I just included the link to our website, um, and, um, and that's all. But yes, we're excited to support um, our bilingual graduate students. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, moving on to the next question. Is this program applicable to practice as a therapist outside of education and schools? And I would say the short answer is yes, given the breadth of professional competencies of which the uh, NAS professional standards encompass, but also uniquely prepared to work within the school settings. Remember that marriage, child, family therapists, clinical psychologists, doctoral level, 
they cannot work in the schools because they're not prepared with the credential to work as a school psychologist. So the answer in short is yes, that there are school psychologists that are uh, licensed educational psychologists who are working as uh, credentialed school psychologists that work in a range of hospital settings, community settings, uh, school-based settings. But again, with a strong emphasis that they're uniquely prepared to work within the school setting, hence that pupil personnel services credential. Also, importantly, let's remember that school psychology is the field, the profession that's able to advance and implement the, the essence of social justice because most children, most days outside of the COVID context are at school, right? They're not wandering around neighborhoods or malls looking for support services. They are showing up at school. And as mental health professionals with a breadth of talents and skills, school psychologists are able to actualize social justice through providing services to all children on each day in, in all communities. And so that's a really unique uh, contribution that school psychologists can contribute within the school setting. So I just want to mention that it's always a strong emphasis that I see is our efforts to advance social justice and meeting the needs of all children, regardless of their background or their their uh, affiliate, their history, their language and such. OK, uh, anybody else want to add to that or is that OK as we have a few more? We're OK. All right. Uh, so also in terms of the next, oh, and I see some folks are typing answers. That's smart too, if you want to type an answer. Uh, due to the COVID-19, I lack the research lab experiences that I would have ideally had before applying to uh, next fall. Do you encourage students like me to take a gap year to get adequate preparation? That's an excellent question. I think that there's a couple of realities that there's been many individuals who are similarly impacted due to COVID-19. So there is uh, a general um, lack of opportunity that was presented uh, this past year and a half or so. But um, you, you, we've had individuals apply and apply again. So there's certainly something to be said for uh, giving it a go. But it, it's true that maybe there are others who have more experiences and are, are more competitive and ultimately are uh, admitted. But we've literally had individuals who apply who interview with us, who then aren't selected to be admitted that year, but then the next year they reapply, they interview with us, and then they're uh, admitted. So it is it is the case that uh, other than the fees associated with applying and time and energy that uh, you might consider that, for instance, but also that there's many individuals who are impacted by this uh, COVID context in terms of uh, lack of uh, research and lab experience. Yeah. Okay. Um, how many master students uh, are you expecting to admit the next fall? Likely about eight to 10. So instead of the three to four that we used to admit, uh, we're anticipating around eight to 10 that we'll be admitting. Um, okay. Now, what's the next one? The final interview would be with the potential PI or the department committee. Well, two things. One is that the very initial interview, as was described, that you have with us will include multiple of us as faculty because we're looking for that goodness of fit with our program, as was described. That will include, uh, particularly if the individuals that you identified as a potential good fit as a primary advisor, that they would be included there. For the master's students, again, that's less important that you identify the specific faculty member. For the doctoral students, very important. That happens individually. So you're absolutely right. There are programs that literally review all the applicants at a committee level. We do not do that. We review all of the applicants at a faculty level that each of us as faculty are reviewing each of the applicants looking for that potential goodness of fit. We then do the interview, the Zoom interview, and then we also participate in that second phase of interviews, which will include invitation to join us on campus uh, where you can obtain information. We can also gather a bit more information. And uh, typically we invite about half of the individuals roughly that we interview in the first phase 
we invite about half of those individuals to the campus interview. So we narrow it down to typically about 10 or 12. For the doctoral program, we'll probably narrow it down to about you know, uh, 15 to 20 for the master's program. Okay. All right. All right, who wants to share this one? I was wondering if legal status could be an impediment to attend UCSB as a PhD student. I am undocumented non-DACA recipient and understand this may represent a problem, especially to receive funding. Um, I, I can continue to share if you'd like, uh, some of our colleagues being newer, this might be more complicated. We do have undocumented uh, doctoral students at UCSB and that has been a strong commitment. We are a Hispanic serving institution, HSI, uh, but in terms of the funding element that can be complicated on some of the uh, potential funding packages, but not all funding is uh, contingent upon that. So what I mean by that is that some of the specific grants or federal dollars that may require someone to be a permanent resident and or have documentation, but other fellowship programs are open to all for uh, application and such. So I would encourage you to follow up with uh, further communications, but I can say that we have had and presently have multiple students who are uh, not documented. Okay. Uh, Tina asks, uh, my second question is about what you just mentioned, the process of free housing options for PhD students. So in terms of being a graduate student uh, hall director, basically, for those of you who are familiar with being an undergraduate uh, resident hall director, you are available to help facilitate the incoming transitions to help problem solve for the students that are there. Fortunately, with the graduate students, it tends to be a bit different sorts of uh, dynamics relative to the undergraduates. And with that uh, obligation of uh, helping to facilitate the communications internally, help address uh, issues as they arise, living in the, um, you know, the, uh, in the, in the housing, that uh, it also affords you your own, in the way that they have done it, you have your own room, um, it's not a shared room, and meaning that you have all of the graduate student housing is individual bedrooms, but some of them have that shared space, whereas the resident hall directors have always had their own room with their own living room and their own kitchen. So that's always been a nice advantage. And then again, it covers that. So hopefully that's helpful for you to uh, be aware of. Okay. Who's got the next one? Currently a PhD student at the Department of Education at GGSC. Can I still apply to your program? Well, all right. That is possible. It would be switching from one doctoral program to another, but that is possible. Some students have done that. It's more common to have students transfer from like a master's in education into the doctoral doctorate in uh, school psych. But, uh, you know, hey, if you're already here at UCSB and in the building, then you should seek us out and let's talk to find out about your particular situation. It might be that um, applying to the doctoral program makes sense. It might also make sense to work with us and complete your current doctoral studies, depending upon your career aspirations and your interests and such. But yes, the short answer is it is an option, but let's make certain that we speak with uh, your, your advisor, for instance, and also um, speaking with you uh, here at UCSB. Thanks for that question. Are there opportunities to form areas of specialization or concentration in the PhD program? Absolutely. That's a uh, full stop, yes, because you'll be working and collaborating with us as faculty and students take on areas of emphasis of specialization and there's lots of opportunities and we are collaborative in those endeavors, so yes. Are there, uh, I'm interested in working as an advisor in higher education with a focus on formerly incarcerated, underrepresented students. Would the MED program be a good direction for me to go? What's our committee say? Um, I guess if you're interested in higher education, do you mean like uh, college level? Generally, for the school psychology field, it's generally a K to 12, unless you're talking to special education that ends, you know, 21, 23, I can't remember the age, but they're still within the public school settings. Um, so I think if you're interested in higher education, meaning college, community college, and, and those areas, that this might not be the best fit, but I'll let others respond. 
I'll also say that that may not necessarily, maybe the MED program wouldn't be the best option. You know, it depends on, um, like if you plan on working as an advisor in higher education, um, I'm not sure if, if an MED in school psychology is the, the best option or the certainly the neatest way into that particular career path. Excellent, thank you. A uh, question that we had uh, mistakenly, I think, skipped over, but is being published or uh, advised required for this program? Well, it's not required. It's certainly strongly embraced as those previous experiences in engaging in research and scholarship certainly lends itself to the accomplishments and pre preparation that factors into that goodness of fit to excel in uh, our doctoral program here at UCSB, but also recognize that we welcome those individuals with master's degrees in school psychology who have been working as a school psychologist for a few years. That's really rich. You may not have published during that period because your primary responsibilities were uh, providing services directly to children and staff and teachers and families, right? But uh, certainly for those of you who have had an opportunity to uh, do the research and publish, that's a value added, but not required. And again, whether you have a master's degree in school psychology or special education, or you've been a teacher, don't worry about not having the publications um, in that regard, because we know you've also had tremendous life experiences working with children that further inform your um, scholarship. And so in that sense, it's practice to science, isn't it, right? So there's science to practice, but there's also practice to science. So that we equally value that. Um, how do you weigh clinical experience versus research experience of applicants? And this is a scientist and practitioner model program. I think we kind of just answered that in a certain degree, uh, clearly having those strong research skills and foundational knowledge is value added. But as I just mentioned, there's also a path for those who have tremendous practical clinical experience working with children and realizing that oftentimes you are competing against those other applicants who might be coming into applying to our doctoral program already having a master's degree in school psychology, maybe even having worked for three to five years. So it, it is a it's a it's a high bar, especially for those coming for from undergraduate. I know that there were a large percentage of participants, but doesn't mean it's impossible. And every year there's an assortment of individuals across the board. So it could be you, which uh, wh whichever group that you follow it. Okay, what do we got next? Uh, thank you. Oh, okay, thank you for that answer. Same process for the clinical program. Uh, yes, it is the same process above for the clinical program. There's a counseling and a clinical program in the department. And the answer is yes, they do their interviews based on individual faculty advisors, not uh, as a department committee. I think that was the key question. And then uh, would you mind talking about the commitment that this program has in regards to social justice within the school setting? Um, I mentioned just briefly, but I'd, I'd, I welcome our colleagues to share any additional information about our program's commitment to advancing social justice. I have some ideas, but I definitely wanna hear from our colleagues. I can take this one. Um, I answered it um, in the chat, but what I can say is that, you know, as a faculty, you know, just first off the bat is that we're committed to decolonization of the curriculum, which will inform our school based practices. And then when it comes to teaching and instruction, uh, foundational level courses like assessment and intervention, we're always looking at, you know, the inherent biases that some of these assessments have. Like we can always appreciate and examine the clinical utility of these assessments, but there's always inherent bias. And that is definitely a social justice effort because when it comes to social justice, what we're trying to do is kind of elevate and um, yeah, elevate the voices of those who've been muted and silenced historically. And so it's it's an ongoing effort, and each year we just get better and better um, at um, meeting that goal. And yes, uh, Dr. Jemison put in our link the school psychology unified anti-racism statement um, that he collaborated on. So yeah, I hope that answers the question. Um, um, yeah, additional information, Dr. Goodwin. Yes, and and I just want to also underscore how important advocacy is 
um, with regard to the role of the school psychologist on uh, uh, a school campus, right? And we earlier had talked about the excellent caliber of students and faculty that we have. And we always, um, operate from the position of how can we support kids and how can we improve equity and how can we support diversity and multiculturalism. And a lot of the persistent problems that we have in schools, schools in California, schools nationwide, um, so the persistent problem of uh, disproportionality, right? Um, issues with regard to um, equity and opportunity. Uh, when we say be the change, right? As school psychologists, you're really equipped to and empowered to support that change. And we encourage that for all of our students um, and our faculty practice that ourselves. Excellent. Uh, any more you wanted to add, Dr. Ortiz? Are you good with that? Yes, I completely embrace what both Dr. Thompson and Dr. Goodwin articulated. As noted, I put in the chat, just for example, three links to articles that we have uh, published as faculty that we have contributed to, and we collectively take a strong, uh, strong position on the importance and the actions involved in advancing social justice in the field of school psychology. Uh, several of those uh, publications that you can click on in the chat reflect our commitment in terms of uh, the school psychology unified call for deeper understanding, solidarity, and action to eradicate anti-AAPI racism and violence, as well as the school psychology unified anti-racism statement and call to action, which have each been endorsed by all of the major school psychology associations in the United States, but our program has also signed on to that. And as Dr. Thompson uh, shared, I've had the good fortune of collaborating with colleagues to contribute to crafting these uh, documents, as well as the other piece about advancing the um, diversity, equity, and inclusion in our scholarly publications and in our science and as editor of School Psychology Review, if you uh, have an opportunity to look at the uh, journal website and the Twitter, you'll see that we have a tremendously talented group of exceptionally diverse colleagues who are literally being the changes Dr. Goodwin had, had highlighted in terms of uh, advancing the field. And again, both Dr. Thompson and Dr. Goodwin contribute as editorial board members. And so uh, this is what we're doing. And hopefully as, as you listen to their responses, you got a clear understanding that this is a strong commitment that is a shared commitment across all of our faculty here at UCSB. There's much to be done. We understand that. We, un we know that we're gonna need to work harder and we have a commitment, a shared commitment to it. Uh, the next question was, how many applicants do you typically get each year? And I can kind of share it based on uh, contemporary trends and then the uh, little bit of gap, but also communicating with our colleagues at other master's programs. So on the doctoral level, we typically anticipate having around 75 to maybe 100 applications. Uh, we're going to admit uh, about four students. So it is highly competitive, right? Um, on the master's level, we had generally received about a similar number of applications, and then we were admitting three to four, but now we'll be admitting roughly eight to 10, so double the chances, so to speak. With that, my caveat is that there are multiple programs that I'm aware of at the master's and specialist level who during the past few years, they used to receive you know, 75 or 100 applications, and now they're receiving 200 or 300. So I just uh, share that because since we haven't been accepting applications to our master's program uh, during the past few years, it could be that those uh, application numbers are, are a bit higher, that it, it could be, that's a possibility. Okay. Would students with both undergraduate and graduate degrees not in psychology or education uh, be a good fit? What do you folks think about that? Both undergraduate and graduate degrees. 
not in education and not in psychology. Do you have some comments on that? I, I think it's fine. Um, so with students with both undergraduate, I, I think that everyone is moldable. Um, students who come in, enter our program, like we're pliable. You know, I like to say you guys are like clay and mold and we'll just mold you. So I think it's fine. You, you may lack some foundation, but it's nothing that you're unable to learn. Like you're able to learn as long as you're willing to put in the work. And depending on your background, it might enhance the learning environment, right? Having, um, you know, we embrace diversity in terms of backgrounds, and including educational backgrounds, right? Um, so if you have a background in some other field, I'm pretty sure that there are uh, transferable skills and even knowledge that might uh, enhance our program and enhance your learning. I agree. Yeah, someone who has an art history background or an engineering, and they bring different ways of thinking. So I, I agree. And there are some examples of this. Uh, and those individuals, as was articulated, often are able to articulate the goodness of fit in their application materials to help connect the dots so that uh, we're not just sitting there wondering how that's going to work out uh, during their master's or their doctoral studies, uh, for instance. So you, you would want to uh, attempt to clarify that in the application materials, but there are examples of uh, doctoral students coming without, with not having uh, undergraduate or graduate in um, education or psych. Yes. Okay. Are there faculty at UCSB that focus on uh, ABA? And I believe for those of that are not aware of the alphabet soup that we often use in education and school psychology, I believe that this individual is referring to applied behavior analysis. And uh, yes, there are faculty who are um, focused in this area. Uh, in fact, we have the Kegel Autism Center, which is largely emphasizing ABA practices, pivotal response uh, therapy to support students. Many of our students end up working. Uh, presently, it's uh, the director is Dr. Ty Vernon. Uh, as Dr. Cagle had retired, but he had founded the uh, center. And many students that work with us in school psychology also end up working within that context. I don't know if anyone else wanted to add anything more. Okay. And is it okay to mention two potential advisors if we're applying to the PhD program? Yes, it is. And there's overlap in some of our scholarly interests. And we have a great time here collaborating with each other. We are not a siloed program. Some institutions have three to five faculty who all do their own independent thing. We function quite collaboratively, quite collectively. And there's some overlapping talents. I would suggest that we have particular strengths across social, emotional, behavioral, mental health, as well as uh, academic interventions, preventions, uh, strategies. So absolutely, if there are two or three faculty in the school psych emphasis that you see as a great fit, be certain. There's actually a question that asks you to identify uh, the potential goodness of fit. I say definitely include uh, um, all those that seem to be relevant. Okay, another one. In, if my grades in psychology research courses during the undergraduate were not as strong, is there anything you would recommend doing prior to applying to make myself more competitive, gaining a certificate or some of some kind to show my commitment to getting stronger in that subject matter? Great question. What does our faculty committee say? Let's talk about it in your personal statement, you know, just kind of explain the reason, you know, why you earn those lower than expected marks in psychology research um, courses. Because sometimes, I mean, you know, grades may not always reflect everything, um, but I think that at least, you know, mentioning it in your personal statement would be helpful. And I think if you're looking for more experience to build up your resume or you know, to looking at experiences or opportunities to volunteer to be on research projects, taking a similar course again at a community college or whatnot to demonstrate your commitment to kind of um, bettering yourself in that particular area of week that was once a weakness. Excellent. I agree. 
And uh, the next question is, if I am applying immediately after my bachelor's, so going straight through, am I less likely to be accepted to any program, any program? I'm thinking you're thinking here at UCSB, but maybe you're just asking in general. And so I will say this, when you say less likely, that's a complicated uh, comparison because I'm not certain who is the others like that you would be less likely then. But what I can say is this, that if you're an undergraduate who has extensive experience in the areas of your interest, so for instance, if it's a master's degree application and you've got a lot of school-based experience, you've taken a lot of coursework and you're prepped and ready to go, that, uh, that you would be as competitive as others, right, for that master's uh, degree program. If you're applying to the doctoral program, certainly having those components is good, but also having the research and the scholarly experience can further uh, help you be competitive. Uh, for instance, uh, students who have been lab directors at the undergraduate level, that certainly rises above and beyond. But recognizing that for the applications to the doctoral programs, Oftentimes, there are other applicants who have master's degrees that are relevant and sometimes specifically in that field. And so you as an undergraduate need to uh, highlight your skills, your strengths. And that's always what I recommend is play your strengths and emphasize what you're bringing to the table and what you would contribute to that uh, context of the graduate preparation. And, and you hope for the best in the sense of the goodness of fit. Dr. Ortiz mentioned that right at the very beginning about what we're looking for. And so it could be that you have a little less of this or a little less of that or a little less of both, but everything else adds up. And based on the interview, that we, we can see that strong connection and you bring that to the table. So um, I would encourage folks to, I, I do encourage folks, I, I shouldn't say I would, uh, I work with a lot of undergraduates here at UCSB. I encourage them to apply to master's as well as doctoral programs. And many of them have the good fortune of opportunities to continue and directly go straight through. But for some of them, they, they don't uh, get admitted. Some of them get interviews and don't get admitted. But ultimately, that prepares them for that next round. They can do other things during that gap year in between and then be even more competitive during the subsequent round. But I would certainly encourage anyone who is interested to give it, uh, give it a go, you know, put in your best effort and see whether that great fit happens to be there and try to highlight that in your materials. And I'll add that that goodness of fit, that right fit is of paramount importance. It doesn't matter if you come from a CSU institution, uh, a UC institution, Ivy League institution, HBCU. Um, it doesn't matter so much as the fit. You know, as we described, we want talented, um, committed um, students who are committed to being leaders in the field and to advancing um, school psychology, either as practitioners or as scholars and professors. And, and um, you know, so I, I really want you to think about that goodness of fit, regardless of where you're coming from and your background, because that really is important. And I think it contributes to our, our, the, our commitment to having strong and diverse students. Absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Goodwin. Okay, there's a couple more questions on here. And uh, hopefully through our uh, sharing these responses, you each understand our commitment to fully informing you uh, about the program. And feel free if someone has another question to add here as we're getting down to the last couple that are currently posted. Uh, a question is, are there professors who focus on qualitative work? Yes. In fact, I would make the case that each of us use multi-methods in our uh, studies, in our processes, because uh, sometimes things that we're not publishing are the, pr the precursors to that could be involving other methodologies. Uh, and sometimes our actual published work is multi-method as well. So we do have a strong uh, value uh, across the board on all types of uh, analytical approaches. Uh, qualitative, quantitative, single subject, and uh, meta-analyses, et cetera, et cetera. What we attempt to do is utilize all of our analytical skills to address the key problems that we identify. And often in identifying 
the, the, the questions guide what types of uh, analyses we would uh, need to engage in to, to advance our understanding. And that could be different types of analyses at different phases of a particular project even. So uh, for those of you who have interest in uh, various research methods, again, back to Dr. Goodwin's point, we embrace diversity and that includes methodological, uh, diversity and methodological approaches. Yeah. Uh, okay, another question. I have heard that it is less favorable to apply to a PhD program from the same university that you attended undergraduate at. Is this true? What are some of the reasons as to why this would be the case? That's an excellent question. And I have some thoughts, but I would like to defer to my colleagues to get their perspectives and then see if I have anything to add. Um, so the only thing I can, I've been told that too. I mean, I can just tell you that I stayed at the University of Arizona all from undergrad, master's and um, PhD. The only reason that why I can think of is that you want to get exposed to different ways of thinking and just to be get, expose yourself to a different environment. But I do recall being told that as well, and I was trying to imagine why. But that's what comes to mind. But I'm curious to know what others have to say. So I actually, you know, one of our goals for the PhD program is to uh, produce future faculty. And so what I was always told is that um, for uh, if you wherever you get your PhD, the odds are against you to get a, a academic job at the same institution where you received your PhD. And I can understand that and that they want to um, have richer, more diverse uh, scholarship. I think it might be to your advantage as someone who's an undergrad in an institution to apply to a PhD institution there because you may already have familiarity with the program you can make a case about your commitment to you know uh completing uh, a phd program um you know uh i'm not familiar with with that uh and in many ways i think that it could potentially be uh to your benefit when you make a case about why it's a good fit. You might already be knowledgeable about the um, research and clinical opportunities that are available at a program. I agree. I think it's in your benefit. It's more advantageous. I mean, you know, practically you're already familiar. I mean, you'll have, you'll get, have in-state tuition. I know I did. I mean, I, I was just familiar. I just felt more comfortable. I mean, of course you can go outside your comfort zone and you tend to grow when you're outside your comfort zone, but I do agree with Dr. Goodwin. I mean, I don't think that it's um, any less advantageous to remain at the same institution. Any, you want to chime in on this one, Dr. Ortiz? Good enough? Yes. Um, well, I, I, what, what each of our colleagues had shared resonates with me as well. I will acknowledge that there are some faculty who take a strong position. Um, it, it's the concern about, basically, I would refer to it as uh, sort of that intellectual incest in the sense that there's so much that you've learned uh, that they want you to go into another context in order to learn more and different and grow. But as Dr. Goodwin and Dr. Thompson both articulated, that it varies tremendously across institutions. So I would not give a general statement, a blanket statement suggesting that all institutions will share that particular perspective. But I will also acknowledge that there are some, largely because of the faculty who are there, that take a position that, uh, they, that they would strongly prefer or they don't consider seriously undergraduates from their own program. But I will say that, for instance, here at UCSB, we welcome undergraduates uh, applying. It's probably pros and cons. If, uh, if you haven't ever communicated with us as an undergraduate and then you apply to our doctoral program, it's kind of a weird thing because we're like, where have you been the last two, three, four years? Um, why were you not communicating or collaborating with us then, but yet now you want us to roll the dice on a doctoral program? But there are students who get involved and uh, are successful in transitioning from undergraduate bachelors into doctoral programs and or master's programs at the same institutions. So really appreciate the question. It's a good question. 
want to make, make certain you understand that it does vary institution to institution. There's not a single position on this, but uh, for the reasons that Dr. Goodwin and Dr. Thompson articulated, um, there's both pros and cons. We would certainly encourage uh, applicants from our UCSB undergraduate population here at UCSB. And again, we'll be looking for the goodness of fit. And for those who are interested and happen to watch this uh, info session, we'd say get involved with us. The sooner the better. Uh, have a very strong positive impression. And we've admitted some of those students into our doctoral program uh, over the years, you know, and some of them have excelled in other doctoral programs throughout the country, I would like to also point out. So it's not the case that working with us always results in you becoming a doctoral or a graduate student in our master's program, but sometimes you working with us as an undergraduate then provide you with a competitive edge to become a master's or doctoral student at another institution, whether that be in California or throughout the country. Yeah. Wow, that was a lot of great questions. And I really want to uh, express gratitude to the uh, colleagues for sharing the information and uh, responding to each of these questions so thoughtfully. Uh, as we mentioned at the onset, we have the tremendous good fortune of having a tremendously talented group of faculty who work collaboratively and collectively to uh, advance the field of school psychology at both the master's as well as the doctoral levels, particularly strong emphasis on preparing professionals and scholars and future faculty who will serve and meet the needs and advance understanding of diverse populations of children, uh, culturally, racially, linguistically diverse uh, populations of students uh, that's so critically important and a strong commitment to advancing social justice, particularly uh, contrib contributing to the future of school psychology, both as future faculty as well as future uh, professionals. And so the four of us had an opportunity today to share some great information with you. Thanks to all those who have hung in for the full time period. And um, you can contact us both at our email as well as uh, join in with us on the journey. Those of us that are active on Twitter through social media and also check out our uh, bio and information as was mentioned earlier on the UCSB GGSC uh, faculty website portals. So with that, we uh, express our gratitude for your participation this afternoon, evening, depending upon where you are. We look forward to further communications. And again, the due date for applications for both master's and doctoral students continues to be November 15th. And we look forward to receiving many applications from many of you in, in an opportunity to look at your materials to examine that goodness of fit. So with that, we say thank you and our gratitude, and we look forward to further communications. Okay, good to see you. Thank you again, Dr. Thompson, Dr. Goodwin, and Dr. Ortiz for your contributions this evening. Thank you. Okay, and so with that, folks are trickling off, and I will stop the recording.